Hey there, Prakapton. Welcome back to Practical Stoicism. I'm your host, Tanner Campbell, and today it's Friday. And so we're going to have a bit of a long form episode. Sometimes these are listener mailbag items. Somebody asks a question and I answer it in, you know, a long winded fashion. Other times it's me deep diving into one particular topic that maybe I've got a wild hair across my rear uh, about that particular week. But this week it's a conversation with my friend William Stevens. If you don't know who William Stevens is, you should, and you will, at the end of this episode, but in particular, at least relevant to a lot of what we've talked about in this episode, as you'll hear, he's the co-author of a new book on Epictetus and his Enchiridion. This book is unique, in my estimation. I don't think there is another book that focuses on Epictetus, or specifically the Enchiridion, in this fashion, and to the degree and with the same approach that William and his co-author Scott Aiken do. William is very immersed in the ethics of Stoicism. He takes it to a level of depth that very few do outside of academia. And by that, I mean he doesn't just understand the ethics of Stoicism deeply, as academics who study Stoicism do, because it's their job and they have to. He also takes action on that knowledge and puts it into practice. So William Stevens is one of the very few Stoic academics, academics of Stoicism, that also identify as Stoics personally in their lives. That is, unfortunately, far too uncommon a thing. And it's one of the reasons I'm so grateful to have William Stevens as a contributing partner in a lot of the content that we create at Practical Philosophy. He's written for the actual Stoicism Substack before, he's been on this podcast before, and when I read the overview of his new book and was sent a copy of it, it became very apparent to me very quickly that William had done something special, and I jumped at the opportunity to talk to him about it on this podcast. There are a couple of things to note going into this episode. The first, I feel like I need to say, I was not paid to give this interview. And just as a blanket statement, I'm never paid to interview people, whether they've written books recently or not. Second, the link in the show notes to purchase William's book is not an affiliate link. It's not a trackable link of any kind. It's just a link so that you can go and purchase the book, and I think you should. And I am not paid for making that endorsement. I want to be very clear about that. The second is that this conversation is not like conversations that William has had before. I try to make the conversations on this podcast unique. I don't just want to ask guests the same thing they've been asked on a hundred different podcasts. So we're going to talk about things you might not be expecting us to talk about, like Stephen's family background and other things that aren't really on the radar of a strictly stoic or stoicism related discussion. And then lastly, we went on for so long that I had to cut the last, it's almost 30 minutes, maybe it's even 40 minutes of additional content. That content can't really stand alone as a part two or even a solo episode. What I'm going to do with that extra content is stick it up on the Patreon so that if you are a patron, a supporter of this podcast, you'll be able to go check out those extra 30 or 40 minutes. The last thing you need to know about this episode is that I hope you will listen all the way till the end, because William and I talk a little bit about a workshop that will be taking place next Sunday, as in not two days from today, but the following Sunday, the 12th of November, that is focused entirely on the dichotomy of control and the Enchiridion, and William will be there for that, and I hope, I th hope I can get Scott, although that's a thought I'm having as I'm recording this. I haven't actually spoken to Scott, and I have no idea if he'll be available to do that or have any inclination to participate if he does have availability, but I'm going to try. In either event, myself and William will be at this workshop. It will be 90 minutes long with at least 30 minutes of freewheeling open audience Q&A, and importantly, it will be free but you do have to register for it so we can send you the link so that you can get to it when it goes live. So stick through the episode or, you know, just check the show notes now. <laughs> I guess you don't have to listen to the whole episode for a link to that workshop and to register for it. And with that, I suppose I have done enough of an intro, so we will jump right into ads. Before I do, though, special thank you to Eduardo, Terry, and Connor 
for being the latest to become patrons of this podcast. If you would like to support this podcast and get some cool stuff, you can do so by going to stoicismpod.com forward slash members or actualstoicism.com forward slash support. Or you can check the link in the show notes. It's always there. Supporters are really critical to this podcast and my ongoing ability to dedicate so much time to it. And as you heard in the last episode, even though I'm still running ads for previously arranged agreements with my existing or now past podcast network, I am now on my own. So Patreon support is the only support I have. So you want to see this show continue, you want to help me make a living, becoming a patron would be really helpful, if you can afford to. And if you can't, that's the way it is. So here are some of those aforementioned ads, and on the other side, you'll hear my conversation with William Stevens. I have used a lot of commerce platforms in the past. By far, the most robust is Shopify. No matter how complex your business needs and no matter how large your business grows, Shopify can handle it. And they do handle it for brands like Rothy's, Ruggable, Allbirds, Knox, Magnolia, Brooklinen, Glossier, and Cotton, to name a few. You may already use another e-commerce platform, and you may be super unhappy with it, but you've already put a lot of work into it, and migrating to Shopify could seem impossible. But I'm here to tell you that it is quite easy. When I migrated to Shopify back in 2022, their apps and tools meant I just had to make a few clicks and everything was ported over as if by magic. Shopify also lets you design your storefront however you like, which, from personal experience, I know isn't the case for many other commerce platforms out there. All these features and all this control can result in more sales more often, so stop leaving sales on the table, switch your business to Shopify today, and discover why millions trust Shopify as their all-in-one commerce platform to build, grow, and run their businesses. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial at shopify.com forward slash practical, all lowercase. That's one month for just $1 at shopify.com forward slash practical, shopify.com forward slash practical. It's 2024, and I'd like you to kick off this somewhat arbitrary divide between past and future the right way, with a clear and focused mind that's prepared to take on the next 12 months. And so would my sponsor, Neurohacker. I have struggled with attention issues my whole life, and I've tried a lot of remedies to help me to overcome those struggles. Some didn't work, others had side effects, and others were too expensive or demanded an unrealistic amount of my time. Then, in 2022, I found Neurohacker's Qualia Mind Supplement. Qualia Mind is a nootropic that combines 28 of the most research-backed nootropic ingredients on Earth into the ultimate brain fuel formula, Qualia Mind. And it's been changing people's lives now for years, including my own. The formula is non-GMO, gluten-free, even vegan, and all its ingredients work in concert to assist your brain in achieving focus and clarity. It's also backed by a 100-day money-back guarantee, which I doubt you'll need, but is always a nice thing to have just in case. If you struggle with attention or focus issues, or if you'd just like a boost in these areas, see what the best brain fuel formula on earth can do for you. Go to neurohacker.com forward slash practical for up to $100 off Qualia Mind. And as a listener of Practical Stoicism, use the code PRACTICAL for an extra 15% off at checkout. That's neurohacker.com forward slash practical and use the code PRACTICAL for an extra 15% off to experience life-changing mental performance from Qualia Mind. Hey there, Prakaptan. Thank you for putting up with that ad break. You know, those ads are kind of what allow me to do this so frequently. So if you want to get rid of them, that's cool. You can become a patron for just $5 a month by going to actualstoicism.com forward slash support or stoicismpod.com forward slash members. Whatever link you use, it's in the show notes. So check that out. Today, I'm chatting with Dr. William Stevens. And rather than just completely ruin an introduction, right, trying to build this really pompous thing to impress William, I am instead going to let William Stevens introduce himself, tell you who he is, and then I'll tell you why we're talking about him and talking with him. William, who are you? Introduce myself. Who I'm just a guy. I'm just a regular guy. <laughs> just some guy. I'm just a regular 61-year-old retired philosophy professor who taught for 30 years at a Jesuit Catholic university, some have heard of, most because of the men's basketball team, Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, but I did have a life prior to that. Uh, is that the sort of thing you want to learn about? 
Yeah, I kind of want to know, where did William Stevens come from? And how in the world did he decide to wind up at a Jesuit college in Nebraska uh, to teach philosophy and Stoicism? So I am the second son of university professors. So I was really kind of literally born into academia, for better or worse. I grew up in West Lafayette, Indiana, which fans of the Big Ten will know is the home of Purdue University, the old golden black. And my father was a psychology professor at Purdue in the psych department there. And my mother specialized in typical and atypical language acquisition in children. And she got her PhD at Purdue and then taught at Purdue in the communicative, uh, sorry, audiology and speech sciences department. And my mother's background, they met when they were at DePauw University, when they were students there. And my dad wrote for the college newspaper and publications there. And my mom was a thespian. She loved to act. And so the kind of theatrical skills that she had in great abundance were excellent for her career as a teacher before she became an actual professor. And my dad was always, uh, my mom told me that my dad was just a gifted theoretical psychologist. And I believe my dad was kind of a deeply wise man. So uh, my brother has a PhD, but I got mine before him, my older brother. I love that you're sure to point that out. (laughs) (laughs) No rivalry there. No rivalry at all. He probably went to some lesser school in eastern Nebraska. Well, no, no. Remember, I I got my PhD. Yeah, remember while I'm telling you. Yeah. So no, I grew up in Indiana. So I went to the College of Worcester for two years. And then uh, I transferred because I also was familiar with the philosophy department at Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana, which is a small Quaker school. And I knew some of the philosophers there. It was a small department, but had very good philosophy professors teaching there. And then they hired this new guy um, who was well-touted. So then I transferred from my junior and senior year to Earlham College. And that's where I got my degree. I studied uh, ancient Greek and Latin and classics at Worcester and Earlham and majored in philosophy. And so then, uh, and, and but I had an interest in ancient Greek wisdom since high school because I had an excellent Latin professor, a Latin teacher in high school in West Lafayette. He would put quotations from Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and Herodotus uh, and Thucydides on the, the bulletin board of his classroom. And we had um, an old set of 1972 World Book Encyclopedias. And so I pulled out the first volume, the A's, and one of the early entries is Anaximander and Anaximenes. And so I started reading these little paragraphs about these pre, what I later learned were pre-Socratic philosophers, the earliest Milesian philosophers. And I thought it was all really very cool. I thought ancient wisdom was really interesting because they were so far removed in time from us, but they had such interesting imaginative ideas about how to understand the world and human beings and the relationship between the two. So that was my first introduction to the ancient world, ancient Greece and Rome, classical civilizations. And so I didn't know much about philosophy, but I knew I wanted to study it when I went to college. And so I did. And the more I studied it, the more it got its grips on me. And so I majored in philosophy and and minored in classics and then decided, you know, I want to keep learning. So I applied to graduate schools and I got a nice offer for a teaching uh, research ship or fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. It was recommended to me because there was a very great scholar there named Charles H. Kahn who wrote uh, a, a fundamental, a seminal work on the Greek verb to be. And then he also followed that with a book on Anaximander and the ancient Milesian cosmogonies and cosmologies. And studying with Charles Kahn was great. And he was the one, he was the one, after I had taken several courses from him and I really enjoyed um, studying the Socrates of the early Platonic dialogues. But I was concerned that so many grad students had chosen to write their dissertations on Plato that I wouldn't really be able to contribute very much because there's literally thousands of years of research on on Plato Socrates and on Plato and Platonic dialogues. So he thought a, a fresh direction might be doing something different. And so he suggested to me that I look at Epictetus. Because back in the late 1980s, I came to Penn in 1984 um, to do my graduate work. You know, back then, Tony Long was one of maybe three people who were writing on the Stoics back then. And it wasn't popular. It wasn't all the rage. Can I ask, 
when he suggested Epictetus, were you like, oh, man, that sounds lame. That's not cool. <laughs> or were you excited? No, to the contrary. I'd never heard of the guy. I'd never heard of Epictetus. I, I had heard of Stoicism. I mean, I having studied the history of ancient philosophy as an undergrad at the College of Worcester and at Earlham, and then taking courses with Kahn and others at Penn. But Kahn was, you know, the expert in ancient Greek and Roman philosophy. That is saying something, isn't it? To have gone that far in philosophy and Epictetus is just completely off your radar. That says something about Epictetus not being paid much attention to, I guess. That's exactly right. In 1985, 1986, who knew who Epictetus was? No one was talking about Epictetus. Again, Tony Long, A.A. Long, was the only one writing about Stoicism back then. And so... So Khan, very wisely and prudently, he realized this is a fertile area and not, you know, people aren't writing their dissertations on Epictetus or on Stoics. And he actually suggested, if I remember right, that I look at the early Stoics. Well, the problem with the early Stoics is their works are in very fragmented form and they're reported by later authors. Whereas with Epictetus, at least you have a decent body of work written by his student, Arian. So it seems to be more or less directly Epictetus's actual lectures and thoughts as edited and presented by his student Arian. So I picked it up and I loved it. And why did I love it? Well, because who is Epictetus's biggest hero in the discourses? It's Socrates. I got into it. I loved his very frank style. And the other reason that I was so drawn to Epictetus in particular was, like Musonius, he was a teacher. He was a teacher of Stoicism, a masterful teacher, a famous, renowned teacher. And as a graduate student, I was teaching undergraduates. And so I was developing my own teaching style and my own pedagogical voice and my own techniques. And I found ancient philosophy fascinating and more specifically Hellenistic philosophy was particularly interesting to me. And Stoicism is a Hellenistic philosophy and Epictetus is a not Hellenistic Stoic, but a later Roman imperial Stoic. So that's how I got into it. The other aspect I should mention is uh, my background from the age of, I don't know, seven. My love of baseball growing up in Indiana. I love to play baseball and I love to watch Jack Brickhouse do broadcasts the old, old broadcast of Jack Brickhouse. This is this dates me, of course, of the Chicago Cubs. We're all about to go on a journey we didn't expect to when we started this episode. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so being being drawn to the Cubs, growing up in Northwest Indiana and growing up as a Cubs fan, I knew more than my share of heartache. And so I think, you know, everyone faces different kinds of adversity. I did not face much adversity growing up. I was very, very fortunate. But I did have heartache watching my Cubs lose, especially late in the season. And so later I would explore the relationship between being a Cubs fan and Stoic principles, being a Stoic spectator. What I really love about that story in particular is that you said you were trying to find your pedagogical voice. Pedagogue. A pedagogue is someone who leads, literally is someone who would, would lead children to school. A pedagogue in ancient Greece would be an older slave, male, who would, by the hand, lead the young children of a household to, to school, to a teacher. So uphill, both ways in the snow, and we couldn't escape because <laughs> this guy was taking us. That's right. Yeah, so pedagogical having to do with teaching technique. So you're saying you're trying to find your voice, and the thing that I like and find very funny, is that Epictetus is known contemporarily as being kind of a mean, grumpy teacher, very direct, very curt. Some might, some might say even rude. And you are so far removed from being any of those things. With oh, him. oh, Tanner, my friend, Tanner, you say that, but you've never, you haven't been in one of my classrooms for five minutes. Ah, I see. I see. I, I, I yeah, I'm, I'm a, I'm a curmudgeon. I'm a friendly curmudgeon. I'm a friendly curmudgeon. I don't, suffer fools gladly, I guess you could say. I try to be more forgiving and patient, but by disposition, I'm very impatient, very impatient. So I've had to really work on that vice and try to become more patient. Um, and in the classroom, it would always annoy me every single time when a student would come to class late. 
And I know that, you know, and even though I knew that undergraduates have a lot going on, they're under a lot of pressure, they've got, they've got personal issues, you know, they're dating, they're trying to figure out who they are and who they're going to be and who they want to be and what to major in. And they, they, they've got to get their course credits. And there's so much pressure to get high grades, high grades, high grades. It's a system that they're in and you can't blame them for being so grade oriented. And they would be frustrated with me because I'd say, look, your, your grades don't matter. What matters is what you learn. And it's not the same thing. And five Five or 10 years from now, after you graduate, you're, you might look back and realize that you learned important stuff about stoicism and about life and being a good person and getting along with others that is valuable and you'll carry with you. You're not going to remember what you got on a 10-point true-false quiz, what grade you got. So I would bend over backwards to help my students. That's true. But I did get frustrated at times, and uh, I tried not to show that in the classroom. So anyway, I got mixed reviews. I always got mixed reviews. Some students loved me. The ones who did well in my class, they gave me very high reviews. But the ones who struggled, I didn't do as good a job helping. I tried. The five-star or one-star philosophy professor exactly. <laughs> from Great. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you get you get ten five stars and you get two one stars, and that pulls down your average. But you know, again, what's a stoic attitude about that? You know, you do the best you can. People are entitled to their opinions, even if they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got now a picture of William Stevens classroom, William, and. In public, William, different uh, curmudgeonness levels, let's say. Know a little bit about your upbringing and your childhood. Why are we talking to you on this podcast? Why did I invite you onto this podcast today to talk with the audience? You've written a book. Is that the reason? Yes. So I've co authored a new translation and guide to Stoic ethics based on focusing principally on Epictetus's handbook. Epictetus is Enchiridion in Greek. Enchiridion meaning manual, something that you hold in your hand, like chiropractor. That's where you get the C-H-E-I-R care. And idion, the, the e -E eon ending, I-O-N ending means little. So an Enchiridion is literally in the hand little thing. In the hand little thing. Can I ask, when you named this book, when you titled this book, I noticed that you spell Enchiridion not in the way that it is usually spelled in contemporary times. Was this a debate amongst you and your co-author as you were titling it? Should we spell it the way everyone's spelling it now, or should we spell it in the more traditional fashion? You mean dropping the E after the H? Yes. Um, okay, so when you transliterate from a, a Greek word to the Latinate alphabet, there are certain conventions that some people follow and other people follow other conventions. So in this case, uh, spelling it C-H-E-I-R, etc., keeps the epsilon in there, which is in the Greek word. So uh, you, you, I, I guess people drop that second E because they are afraid that someone might pronounce it enchiridion or something like that. But in Greek, the E-I is an E eh sound, so I, I don't know. It's just, there are two different conventions on that. This is the more literal transliteration I could, I could suggest. I've really only asked that question, William, to prove to everyone listening that you were in a position to actually translate this book. Oh, oh yes, <laughs> it's, well. <laughs> it's now evidenced. And, and before the end of this, I will ask you to tell us how exactly to say Epictetus's name, Epictetus's name, or I've, I've heard some other pronunciations. Which do you prefer? Right. Well, so in Epic Epictetus's case, uh, I prefer the pronunciation Epictetus because that second E, the one in the middle, is an eta. So uh, it, it's a long vowel, Epictetus. So in Anglophone discussion, right, in English-speaking discourse conversation, we, we would say uh, Epictetus. I don't, the accent is not on the antepenalt. So the antepenalt is the third to last syllable of a word. The penalt is the second to last, and the last syllable is the ultima. So it's not epictetus, it's epictetus, or epictetus. You've heard it here. It's epictator tot. <laughs> epictator tot. Epictators. <laughs> Okay, so the book is Epictetus's Enchiridion, A New Translation and Guide to Stoic Ethics. We know you're more than qualified to translate and create a new translation off of this book. 
but what is the point of discussing the ethics? Because, and I think I know the answer to this, but I want to give you the opportunity to explain the reason yourself, because of every translation of Epictetus I've ever come across, it is not usually accompanied by an ethical interpretation of these things. You've done something that, at least in as far as my reading is concerned, is unique, and I'd like to know why you've done that. What moved you to do it? You want to make Epictetus accessible, but you seem to think the ethics of this very, very long dead Stoic still holds a lot of weight today. Can you comment on that? Yeah, well, I mean, he he's one of the best sources of ancient Roman Stoicism, period, straight up. We've got Seneca. He's got the biggest corpus. Seneca is a very complex thinker. He's a very sophisticated thinker. But some people, although they they know that Seneca is a beautiful writer and a very smart theoretical, you know, a very smart thinker when it comes to Stoic ethics and Stoic theory and doctrine, with Seneca, you don't have quite the same sincerity, at least some people think, because he was fabulously wealthy. He was in a position of tremendous influence and power as the tutor of Nero. So he exerted, and he, he was, came from a wealthy family, and he became even more wealthy because he lent out his money and got huge interest rates back. And so um, Seneca is a very affluent kind of Stoic, which is a bit oxymoronic, right? It's a bit of a paradox. And he talks about his wealth and so forth, and he owned a lot of slaves. But it's one thing to own slaves, and it's another thing to be a slave. And Epictetus was a slave. His mother was a slave. He was born into slavery. We know that about him. We don't know much beyond that of his early life, but he traveled to Rome at some point when he was a teenager, I guess, or, or you know, a youth. And he was the, he became the property of Epiphroditus, this freedman secretary. And then his master allowed Epictetus. And what does Epictetus mean? What does the name mean? Let's, let's start right there. We were talking about how to pronounce Epictetus. What does it mean? It means acquired. So the guy's name means bought. It means acquired. How many people read Epictetus and don't know what the name means? Yeah. And, and, and imagine being not just a slave, but a slave whose name is acquired. Acquired. That's quite something. Right? Because if you're born the, 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 the son of a slave woman, the name you get is the name your master gives you. And so maybe, you know, his mother gave him a name. We don't know what it was. But then, it, but he changed hands. He was bought and sold. And one guy who bought him just said, oh, I, you know, they didn't, they didn't ask him what his name was. They said, we're going to call you Epictetus. We're going to call you Acquired. So maybe we should call him Acquired for the rest of this interview, right? Just to drive that point home. <laughs> But, I, but my point is simply that his reality, his life, is very different. As far removed as you could imagine from someone of the wealth and, and, and social standing and education of a Seneca, of a Seneca the Younger, and even farther removed from my man, Marcus Aurelius, the Stoic Emperor, right? Who also, very well-connected family, high social status, never hurting for money, and so forth. So Epictetus is at the bottom rung. He started at the bottom rung of the social ladder, whereas Seneca and Marcus Aurelius started near the top, and Marcus made it to the top, becoming the most powerful, most powerful Stoic who ever ruled anything. Does that answer your question? It no, the ethics. Why on the ethics? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so... So can we talk a little about the the six core themes of Stoicism as Scott and I see it in the book? Uh, yeah, I think that we can absolutely do that. This is a Stoicism podcast. Let's do it. Let's do it. So Scott and I identify what we see as six core themes of Stoicism. And these are core themes both in Epictetus's handbook and in Epictetus's philosophy more broadly, including the discourses. But you also see these themes in to a lesser extent in Musonius, but certainly in, in, in Seneca and to, to some degree in Marcus Aurelius too. So the first core theme is the necessity of self-control. Stoicism is about self-control, right? The, the thinking is that if you can handle yourself, if you can manage yourself, if you can, if you can keep a pretty tight rein over not only your thoughts, but also your decisions and how you react to things, as a result of how you think about those things, 
then you're going to avoid negative emotions and you're going to enjoy happiness. So the necessity of self-control is the first theme. The second one is that Stoics insist on seeing things as they are. Seeing things as they are. Not as you want them to be, not as other people tell you they are, but as they actually are. So Stoicism emphasizes this kind of realism, right? A reality check. How are things really? The third core theme is living according to nature. And this is the definition of the goal, the telos, for all the Stoics, from the earliest Stoics on. The goal in life is to live in agreement with nature, live in accord with nature. And nature is a very uh, rich concept, and so we can unpack that. But you want to avoid at all costs living and acting contrary to nature, and you have to train yourself. You have to learn how to live in agreement with nature or live in accord with nature. The fourth core theme is that virtue requires doing your duties, and your duties are defined by your roles the roles that you occupy in life. So in order to know what you should do, you have to understand what your roles are. Are you a daughter? Are you a sister? Are you a mother? Are you a worker or an employer? Are you an employee or an employer? Are you a fellow traveler? Are you riding on a bus? Or are you riding on a plane? You've got relationships to the other people on the bus or on the plane, right? Um, are you on a team? Are you recreating? If you're a teammate, then you have a certain role and you have duties that flow from that role. Are you a teacher? Are you a student? Students have certain duties because of their role as student. Teachers have certain duties because of their role as teacher and so forth and so forth. So there are lots of different examples of roles. We occupy multiple roles over the course of a lifetime. Some we take up for a while and put down. Um, others we have our whole lives, right? You and I will always be sons. In a few months, you're gonna become a father. Congratulations, that's gonna be awesome, right? And what's gonna happen is your life is gonna change as you've been thinking about. You're gonna have new duties as a father that you didn't have before, but you're gonna be a great father. Tanner. So don't worry about that. Oh, I like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. The fifth core theme is that having virtue, being virtuous, requires knowing. To be virtuous, to be virtuous requires knowing stuff. What do you have to know? Well, first of all, you have to know yourself. You have to know what your own strengths and weaknesses are, what your own limitations are, what your talents are, and how you can help serve others, right? How you can be useful. That's your role as a social being, is to be useful to others in society. So you have to know your specific strengths and weaknesses, your limitations and talents. But you also have to know your nature as a human being, right? That you are a social, linguistic, political animal, that you're an animal that plays and works, right? That has to eat and sleep and rest. And you have to know how to take care of yourself so that you can be productive and accomplish your goals. So you have to know about human nature and you have to know about human health emotional health, psychological health, in addition to physical health. You also have to know your relationships with others. You have to know who you're related to and how to interact with them, right? And you also have to know how the world works. You have to know, broadly speaking, how the world works, right? The ancients, some of them, the non-philosophers, thought that eclipses and earthquakes and lightning and storms were the gods getting angry and punishing them. And the Epicureans and the Stoics, they knew better because they, they were doing enough science to recognize that these are natural phenomena. These are things that occur. There's no intentionality behind the weather or earthquakes or tidal waves or hurricanes. And then the sixth core theme is that Stoicism is an aspirationalist ethics. Stoicism is a kind of aspirationalism. And you might want to ask, we can go into that in a little more detail. It is actually that in particular, I think, after our first break that I am going to want to go into detail greatly. But I also want to talk about, on the other side of the break that we're about to take, some of the problems in Stoicism, uh, the skeptical problem, the and especially the the weaponization problem I'm really interested in, too, because I think you have good, good answers to these uh, prob, quote-unquote problems with Stoicism that people bring up and pose as 
I guess they're attacks on Stoicism, although I guess I mean that in a different way than most people might think the word of attack, or like uh, philosophical attacks on Stoicism. But, but first, I do want to talk about that aspirational aspect of the philosophy, because that's the part that really gets me motivated as an individual, and it's part of what is central to the purpose of this program. So I think there's some strong alignment there and some interesting things that we'll certainly talk about after we take our first and only break, which is coming up right now. Stay with us. That's what ransomware is all about. It's psychological pressure. Ransomware, when your computer's hacked into and your data held ransom. Attacks are on the rise and Russian gangs are making billions of dollars. The moment I got that message, I knew our greatest fears that we ever have are starting to come true. The post-Cold War era is over. Dot com, the hacking. A new season from Crowd Network with me, Katie Puckrick. Just search for dot com, that's D-O-T-C-O-M, and subscribe. And we're back with William Stevens, author of Epictetus's Enchiridion. I guess the full title is Epictetus's Enchiridion, a new translation and explanation of Stoic ethics. Is that the full title? And guide to Stoic ethics, yes. We're the guides. Terrible interviewer. I can't even remember the name of the book. I've, I've, I've got a copy of it, for goodness sake. We just call it The Guide. The Guide. We call it The Guide. Yeah, The Guide from The, guide from the Guides. Yeah, I, I'm, one of the guy, I'm one of the two guy guides. Okay, great. Love that. Okay, so there's a, there's an aspect of Stoicism that I've recently somewhat ranted about, I think, in this. Maybe I'm becoming a curmudgeon. Yeah, it's okay. There are worse things than being a curmudgeon. That's okay. Yeah, that's true. Well, I, so I go on this rant about there are lots of Discord communities and Facebook, not our Discord community, of course, which everyone should join by going to stoicismpod.com forward slash Discord. It's just a nice little plug there. Hope you yeah. don't mind, William. Yeah. Uh, not our Discord, but in these Discord communities and Facebook groups and Slack communities probably also, although I've not specifically seen those, there is a lot of talk that's focused on, you know, who said what in what text and what's the best way to interpret this. And let's really talk about this from an academic who's absolutely correct about this sort of way. And I think that has its place. And I've said that you've really got to admire people who are very interested in those things, because it certainly takes a lot of brain power to work through and figure that stuff out. So in a way, that's impressive work. But it's not stoicism practice. It's instead, it's, it's more of, like I said, an academic pursuit. And I think that that is really working against the purpose or point of stoicism. And the studying of those texts an interpretation of those texts important, but shouldn't come at the expense of the actual implementation of those things. And so you're talking about this being an aspirational philosophy. I think those things really go hand in hand. Do I have it wrong? No. I, I And recall the, the fifth core theme that Scott and I identify, which is that having virtue requires knowing. So the activity that you describe in these communities is people are working very hard and seriously to know what they're reading, to understand and interpret correctly the primary texts, to understand their Marcus's meditations and their Seneca's letters and Seneca's moral essays and Epictetus's handbook and the discourses. And I hope some of them read some Eusenius Rufus too in his lectures. So they're trying to understand, and that's that's a good thing. This is what this is what academic philosophers, academics in general, do is we study very closely and carefully texts. We interpret them, we explain them, we draw relationships between this this text and this sentence and this doctrine and this argument and this work and other sentences, texts, documents, arguments, and works. And this adds to our understanding of ancient Stoicism, the physics, the logic, the ethics, understanding those three interconnected branches of Stoic philosophy is important and valuable in its own right. So even if you have no interest in living as a Stoic, but you want to understand what Stoicism is, it's well worth your while to spend the time and the effort to interpret these texts carefully. Now, as you say, this leads to debate and disagreement. No, you're not interpreting what Epictetus says in handbook chapter five correctly. This is the way to read it, okay? So there's gonna be disagreement about that. Okay, that'll work itself out as people with better arguments will over time persuade people with less good arguments, we could hope, right? But there are people, there are ancients like Aristo, who say, look, the physics, the logic, who cares? There are people like my buddy Chuck Chakrapani, who is a Stoic minimalist. 
And there are many like him who hold that less is more, less and less and less. And so the way to make Stoic living easier is to cut out all that study of Stoic logic. Just jettison it from your ship altogether. It's ballast. Get rid of it. Stoic logic, get rid of it. Stoic physics, who cares about the ekporosis, the world conflagration? You don't need to know about any of that shit. Oh, excuse me. I'm not allowed to say that, am I? I think you're allowed to. I can just slap a big parental advisory on the front of this episode and say, William Stevens really is a foul-mouthed curmudgeon. <laughs> Thank you. So according to Stoic minimalists, you don't need the physics and the logic at all. And you need only a stripped-down version of ancient Stoic ethics in order to live as a contemporary Stoic practitioner, living Stoic ethics in your actions. So there's some disagreement here about how much stripping down you can do before you don't really have full-blown Stoicism anymore. You have some partial, incomplete, oversimplified version of what Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus and Seneca and Chrysippus and Cleanthes and Zeno were doing what they were writing about and what they were living. And this is what we refer to as Stoicism light, right? This is where this phrasing came from. Yeah. So Scott and I call this Stoic minimalism in our guide. There, there is knowing, we argue that you, you do have to know some stuff in order to manage your emotions, in order to make progress towards virtue. You do have to know stuff about the world and other people and so forth. And that includes knowing stuff about nature, that is physis, that is the physics, and knowing how to handle arguments, make arguments, criticize arguments, respond to arguments, and that's stoic logic, right? So the aspirationalism, this is a different view than Immanuel Kant. Oh dear, now I'm bringing up Kant. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. So you've got the German. We'll be right right back, folks. I have to have the <laughs> another break. We're going to take a, a long break now. The, the bouncers have to come and remove William from the studio. That's right. So people who study the history of philosophy know about Kant. The history of ethics know about Kant. But let's keep it simple. What's Kant? What has Kant got to do with Stoicism and Stoic ethics? In Kantian ethics, an article of faith. A fundamental tenet of Kantian ethics is that ought implies can. If you ought to do something, that implies that, of course, you can do it. It's possible for you to do it. You're in a position to do it. This is Kantian deontology. This is deontology is the fancy word meaning the study of deon, which means something that must be done. It's dutyology, the study of duty. It's worth saying here that deontology, utilitarianism, and virtue ethics are all three distinctly different ways of approaching uh, how we think about morality, I guess. Yes, that's right. How to understand uh, right and wrong. How to understand ethics. And never the three shall touch. Never the three shall touch. Never the two shall either. It's uh, consequentialism, of which utilitarianism is one variety, is a very different approach from deontology and virtue ethics. However, even somebody like Kant discusses the virtues very seriously. And so Kant's framework can be described and understood as an example of virtue ethics. It, I, I think it's more common, more people are inclined to categorize Kant as a deontologist, defining things in terms of duty rather than virtue. But the two are very much connected, as I see it, and Scott and I argue in the book. Well, you are the professor in the room, so I'll let you have that. <laughs> okay. Um, so aspirationalism takes this Kantian dictum, this Kantian... Uh, axiom that ought implies can and reconceives it as uh, the idea that ought implies aspire to. If you ought to do something, but you're not currently capable of it, then what do you do? Nothing? Give up? Throw up your hands and say, it's impossible. It's too hard. I can't do it. I can't do it. No. The Stoic view is that, yeah, becoming a virtuous person who is just and temperate and courageous and wise is really hard. To be consistently virtuous every day 
is extremely difficult. It's like climbing a mountain. You can't climb a mountain in one leap. You take baby steps up the mountain. Sometimes you slip and you slide back down the path a few yards. Do you quit and go back down, down the mountain, just roll downhill because that's the path of least resistance? Not according to the Stoics. You, you dust yourself off. If you're scraped up and a little bit bloodied, you give yourself some first aid. And what do you do then? You resume the ascent. You climb again. You don't climb a mountain in a day. Not if it's a big mountain. You might not even be able to climb it in a week. But you, if you're making progress, right? That's how we opened this interview, right? Procoptantes, right? Progressors. Progress is possible. If progress is possible, then even though I can't bench press 100 pounds now, if I lift weights over months and get bigger muscles and stronger, in time, I will be able to bench press 100 pounds, right? That's aspirational. Can you lift? Can you bench press 200 pounds right now? I sure as heck can't. But if I weight lift it enough over time, over time, I develop the capacity to lift something that's too heavy for me last year, but that I can lift now. This is the idea of aspirationalism. Does it make sense? It does, yes. And I'm curious uh, as to Kant that if you ought and you can't, then you should aspire, which means anything you ought, you should aspire to do. But does Kantian ethics fall short of explaining how you figure out whether you ought? And does Stoicism fill that gap to some extent with role ethics and such? Right. Well, so for Kant, you've got this handy-dandy categorical imperative. The categorical imperative has several different forms or can be formulated in several different ways. And you use your faculty of pure reason to see whether you can universalize the maxim that's describing the action you're considering performing. Act so that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in that of another, always as an end in itself and never merely as a means. This is one formulation of Kant's categorical imperative. It's very principle-oriented, right? This is the principle. And the mac maxim is the fancy word for, if Kant means by maxim, the rule describing your action. So you have to figure out how to describe your action in terms of a general rule, and then can you will that that rule become a universal law, like a law of nature, that all rational beings would follow all the time. This is Kant's procedure more or less. This is not how the Stoics do things. Now, having said that, now I have to qualify it because Jack Viznik, Viznik I don't know how to pronounce his last name, V-I-S-J-N-I-C, he argues that the Stoics do utilize various rules in their decision procedure for how to act. So I can refer you to his book on duty, but Epictetus doesn't get bogged down into this stuff, at least in the handbook in the Enchiridion. But the basic idea is, as I described it, right? If something is not easy to do or not even possible for you to do, the question is, what ought you to do? How do you figure out what you ought to do? Well, as I explained before with that fourth core theme, you have to know what your roles are, and your roles dictate what your duties are. And knowing your roles for Epictetus is super easy. You don't have to do this weird thought experiment with Kant. Can I, can I define my candidate action? What I might, what I'm considering doing. Can I define that by a rule and then universalize that rule and imagine what would, that's not how you do it. It's like, you're, you're a brother. Your brother needs some help, right? Your brother needs, need you to help him with something. Well, what should you do? Well, for Epictetus, everything can be grasped two different handles the way it should be grasped, and the way it shouldn't. It's very binary. This is Epictetus's very binary approach to Stoicism, right? So do you leave? You, so you can leave your brother in the lurch. He needs your help. Well, you're busy. You're doing other stuff. He'll be fine. Let him, let him, let him struggle with it himself, right? That's the handle by which it is not to be grasped. If your brother is reaching out to you for help, there's a reason for it. He's not trying to manipulate you or, or, or waste your time. He's asking for your help because he needs your help. And so what do you do? You help him. That's the handle by which it is to be grasped, right? So knowing what your duty is, helping your brother when he asks, that's pretty straightforward. Now, what if he needs help moving? Well, that's a that's a quick no. That's a definite no. <laughs> <laughs> right? We all know that we all know that. Moving's a hassle, right? Moving's a hassle, but there's some things that he doesn't want to pay some anonymous moving company guy 
to throw onto a truck and risk getting broken, right? Because he has a certain attachment to his preferred indifference, his couch, his desk, his mirror, whatever it is. And whether he's a stoic or not doesn't matter. You're a stoic. So helping your brother move is something that you need to find time to do. And you'll do the best you can. If it's a really heavy couch, maybe you and, and your brother aren't going to be strong enough to move it by yourselves. And so you get a dolly and you might ask somebody else for help or whatever right? And as you're doing this move, you might get all achy and think, you know what? I, I, I've gotten too flabby here. I need to spend a little bit more time lifting weights. And then there you go. There's your aspirationalism again. Get back to lifting those dumbbells, lift some weights, get stronger muscles, whatever, right? But this is the idea of aspirationalism is, you know, you, you, you can't be wise now just by deciding to be wise. No one decides to be just. You commit yourself over years of becoming less unjust. At each turn when you have an opportunity to stand up in the face of things that people are ordinarily afraid of, you choose to become less fearful. That's how you become courageous, right? Over time, face things that seem scary to you, analyze why you find them scary, and use your faculty of reason to convince yourself that they're really not that scary at all. And then over time, as you practice this and remind yourself of this, you'll become more courageous over time. Okay, so we're running out of time. And I knew this would happen because I have a whole list of things I want to talk to you about. And I was like, yeah, we'll fit this in one episode. And I was wrong about that. So I'm trying, I'm thinking as you're speaking how we might solve for that. I have three more things that I want to ask you. And I think that you, that you and I can go long and I can take two of those things and I can give it to the patrons so that at least it's somewhere. Don't worry, those of you who aren't patrons, there's actually a surprise for you at the end of this episode as well. So I think I'm going to, I've got three things. I'm going to let you pick here, William. And also another solution is we could do another episode. No, I can't do it. One, one episode, William. You got. You have to pay another fifty bucks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my my marketing fee. Uh, okay. Fair okay, okay. So so there's no marketing <laughs> fee. This is a joke. William knows that. Okay. Um, so the the first thing I want to talk to you about is is these. The problems. Yeah, these problems, which is one is a skepticism problem that goes something like uh, the Stoics require us to know things, but we can't really know anything. And then the second problem, there are more than these two problems, but these two are the ones that I'm interested in. The second problem is that Stoicism really encourages this kind of cold, calculative, detached, psychopathic almost approach to dealing with people and living your life. And that is is not necessarily the philosophy itself, but those aspects exist. And so Stoicism is too problematic to be pushing or promoting because it runs too high a risk of those things taking a higher standing or something in someone's execution. And then the, and the third thing is your book is about the Enchiridion and the Enchiridion and the discourse is in really Epictetus's entire life uh, once he becomes a philosopher and maybe even before that is leading up to essentially a thesis, a thesis that is, a, that is unless I'm mistaken, his entirely, this dichotomy of control. The thing that he is most well known for, and I'm, I feel like, at least in that verbiage, although I'm sure that's not what he called it, that he is alone in the Stoic canon as, make, as being someone who really makes a central focus of this. I want to talk about one of those three things, and we'll put the other two to the patrons, and then we'll tell the non-patrons uh, what they're going to get. Because th there's more of William Stephen to come, William Stevens to come, but it's not on this podcast. So which one of those three things do you want to talk about, William? Your choice. Oh, that's not fair. I asked you first. <laughs> what do I look like, a podcast producer over here? Well, yeah, skepticism problem, weaponization problem. We're, we're talking about or, or the, well, I suppose, didn't you advertise this as the dichotomy of control? Episode? I have no idea. Maybe I haven't titled. I haven't titled it yet. Oh, okay. Well, let's. Yeah, let's. So talk we about, better go with that. Let's go with that one. Yeah. There's a lot to say about the skepticism problem and our response to it, and the weaponization problem and our response to that. And and I do want to talk about both of those things. But but we can do that another episode, right? Or or on the twelfth. On the twelfth. Who no, don't say anything yet. They don't know yet, William. Oh oh oh. Sorry. Oh man. Edit that out. Edit that out. Sorry. Yeah. We're going to talk about the dichotomy of control. What has been. What has become, what has come to be known by many contemporary students of Stoicism as the dichotomy of control is what Scott and I call in our guide the fundamental divide. And there's a reason why we think that captures what's going on with this bifurcation 
a little bit better than the dichotomy of control. Because it's true that Stoicism emphasizes the necessity of self-control, but when it comes to controlling things outside of your prohiresis, as Epictetus calls it, outside of your volition or your will, um, control has a connotation of manipulation, a kind of, you know, master, slave, or puppet, puppeteer, puppet relationship. And so it's a little bit, it can be a little bit misleading and problematic and actually lend fuel to the criticism of the weaponization problem. So the reason that uh, we prefer to call this either or that Epictetus talks about in chapter one of, of the handbook the fundamental divide is because it is fundamental to his philosophy, to Stoicism. And it is a divide. Um, it divides, it's like a watershed. So fundamental divide, catchy title, think of the continental divide, the rain falls. And if it falls on one side of the mountain, one side of the divide, then it goes downhill to this system of rivers. If it falls on the other side of the continental divide, it goes to the other ocean. The fundamental divide for Epictetus, right? what's up to me and what's not up to me. What's up to me are my thoughts, my desires, my beliefs, my intentions, my values, my choices. What's not up to me is everything else. Everything else is not completely by its very nature up to me. The behavior of others, the relationships that I'm born into, not the ones that I choose, but the ones that I'm born into, the weather, the stock market, all of that stuff. What happens, uh, dust falling on furniture, not up to me. Choosing to dust as often as I do, that is up to me. So we, we, we grasp this division. This is, as you point out, Tanner, this is something emphasized by Epictetus in chapter one of the handbook. And so Arian's choice to edit Epictetus' thought in this way has made the fundamental divide emblematic of Epictetus's philosophy. But notice that this is not how he begins book one, chapter one, section one of the discourses. He doesn't begin with the fundamental divide there. And so I, I think it is pretty clear that this conceptual division, the fundamental divide between what's up to, up to you and what's not up to you, it is at work in Seneca. It is at work in the early Stoics. It's just that it's not featured or presented as step one, as it were, in learning Stoicism in the way that it is in the Enchiridion, in the handbook. That's interesting. So this is probably going to get me in hot water for even making this comparison. But in some ways, it would be like saying, well, being an American, a United States citizen, is not about freedom of speech. But you would say, if you were to read our Constitution because of the way it was framed, you would say, oh, well, that must have been, that must be very central to being an American, right? Maybe that's a sloppy comparison, but something similar is going on here, right? Where Arian is saying, yes. Yes. The, the way Arian's putting it together makes it seem like this is a, a thesis or a primary focus of Epictetus, when in reality, it's just the, f the thing that maybe spoke the most to Arian, and so he put it first. Yeah. Yeah, and, and what we argue, what Scott and I argue in, in our guide is that Arian edited Epictetus' lectures and in the discourses and presented them in these, is it 52 or 53 chapters? I believe it is 52, and I should know this because I just created an audio book of, the, of, the, of this. Yeah, he, he, he arranged them very deliberately such that a, a beginner in Stoicism should start with chapter one and then move to chapter two and three and four and five and move through. We argue that this is just not, this is not a random set of excerpts and extracts from the discourses that you have in the Enchiridion. This is a program of education in which Stoicism 101, the first course is chapter one of the handbook. And then you move forward. And in doing this, you're learning Stoic principles in a valuable practical order so that you can apply them to your thinking and to your acting, to your deciding and to your reacting on how to live, right? Guiding your choices and your desires and so forth and informing your thinking, adding to your knowledge that builds, it builds throughout. And the progressor faces different challenges as she learns 
to apply Stoic principles to her assents and her desires and her aversions as she moves through reading the Enchiridion. And so your example, yeah, so, so sorry, so to pick up on your example, the Constitution talks about a lot of things in addition to freedom of speech. Well, where do freedoms come from? Liberties come from the conception of the nation that we're laying down these principles for, and they apply to citizens. Well, but citizens don't just have rights. Citizens have responsibilities. With every right comes a responsibility. It's not the responsibility of other people to indulge your exercise of your rights. They're they're not there just for you to use, right? You have responsibilities to others. And so, yes, you have rights, but you also have responsibilities, which are claims that others can make on you as a citizen. And that's why in, in the Constitution and in these founding documents, the founding fathers, the originators, they recognize that Democracy isn't going to work unless you have an educated electorate. People have to get the right kind of education in order to participate fruitfully as citizens in a democracy. And if the education breaks down, as some people in Florida are working very hard to break down, down American education, right? Oh boy, oh boy, here we go. Banishing here books, we go. <laughs> banning books, right? Yeah. Demonizing teachers who discuss certain relevant topics with their students. And we'll be right back for part one of <laughs> Stoicism and Politics with Tanner Campbell and William Stevens. That's right. <laughs> one star reviews are gonna rain upon me, Stephen. William, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But it's but it's important, right? To be a citizen, you have to be an educated citizen. You have to get a good public public education and public education is under assault and blah blah blah. So, but th- this 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 is all just to say, yes, Tanner, the analogy that you drew is apt. Ooh, I like that. I like when the things that I do are apt. Well, let's hope that this next thing that I do is apt. We are going to continue talking, but we're going to do so offline and we're going to make the discussion of those problems we talked about before of the skepticism and the weaponization. We're going to make that available to patrons only um, as a way of thanking them for supporting the show. I think we've we've talked about, I think, a fair fair amount for those who do not patronize the show in the good sense of the word patronize. And also, we do have something free for everyone uh, that you and I have been working on for the last couple of days, and that is a workshop on the dichotomy of control and more broadly on the Enchiridion and some of the other things that are discussed within that work. We're going to do that this upcoming Sunday, not this, not sorry, not this Sunday, uh, November the 12th, which is next Sunday. This is going to be live It's going to be an hour and a half, and it's going to feature myself and William talking about this and mostly me getting into the weeds with William about the Enchiridion, uh, not necessarily directly about his book, but we'll talk about that as well. And importantly, and I think everybody will have the most interest in this, it's going to have at least 30 minutes of open Q&A from the live audience. Now, this is entirely free for you to uh, register to attend, but you have to register only so we can uh, manage sending everyone the link so that you can actually come and view it. And, and if you want, you can share that link with other people. You don't necessarily have to make your friends register, but we would appreciate it if you did, because it helps us to know how many people you know are interested in this kind of thing. And maybe we'll do more of those things with future guests. Can they leave a tip if they want to? Can they, can they leave a tip if they want to? William Stevens <laughs> needs book money. <laughs> we, we might be able to, maybe, I don't know, maybe we could enable tips. Anyway, uh, it, it is it is free to attend and you can find out more by going to actualstoicism.com forward slash workshop, or you can just click the link in the show notes. So for now, William, thank you for stopping by and talking to me about your book, Epictetus' Enchiridion, A New Translation and Guide to Stoic Ethics. It's always very fun to talk to you. I hope one day I get to see the grumpy, cranky you. I hope as we become better friends, I will I will get to see you in a moment of complete curmudgeonness. Um, but it's a pleasure having you on the show. You've been on the show before, and we really love you, man. We love having you around. So Thank you, Tanner. You're too kind. You're too generous. It's always a joy for me. Thank you very much, sir. 